Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Rattlecast for, uh, what day is it? Tuesday, September 24th. We have Al Ortolani on the phone with us, and he'll be joining us in just a minute. But first off, let me say, uh, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry and un- unaffiliated with any other organization. We've been publishing poems since 1995, founded by Alan Fox. And um, we just love poetry, and we want these shows to be a way to share and celebrate good poems. And um, if you want to join us for the open mic later, uh, all you have to do is call, or send me a text message, I should say, on Skype. So turn on your Skype app, send me a message to Rattle Poetry, and I will um, answer that and let you know that you're on, and I'll give you a call back when the time is right in about an hour. Uh, The open mic portion starts about an hour into our show. I also have four open mic poets lined up um, uh, that were pre-recorded, which is also an option. If you're interested in doing that for a future episode, go to rattle.com slash rattlecast, and um, you can... uh, (laughs) And uh, and you can... uh, Find instructions how to do that there. Um, so, so this week is a kind of really busy week here at Rattle. This is uh, the week of the Wrightwood Literary Festival, which is uh, September 28th and 29th. It's always the last weekend in September here up in the mountains of Southern California. And um, we have a bunch of featured uh, authors coming in. Uh, Janet Fitch is the keynote speaker. Um, and one of the poets this year is the uh, author of Tales from the House of Vasquez, uh, Raquel Vasquez Gilliland, and I thought is our uh, warm-up poem. I would start um, letting her read a poem from her book Tales from the House of Vasquez, which was one of the Rattle Chapbook Prize winners last year. And um, so let's see. So here she is. This is a. Uh, let me find the poem for you. Here she goes. The Tale of La Llorona. I was born with one eye open on the back of my head. It made it easy to walk along the branches of mango trees. Limb to limb, finger to finger, I walked to the house of my mother, then to my grandmother's. In between, I discovered the house of Vasquez, connected to me and my sister, and my mother, like the marrow of bone. Inside the house were secrets, an eyelash at the grave of my mother's sister, a black pupil looking for my grandmother's silver hair. I asked my mother, why are the Vasquez women born with so many eyes? And she said she thinks it's because we have so many tears. When I was pregnant, it became difficult to wrap my bare feet around mango tree arms. Once, a wind blew so hard I fell. My baby slipped all the way down to where I open, to where my body becomes a star. In order to push him out, I had to cut open my fourth eye. For the first time, I saw a hole from the back and the front, and my God. This whole world is made of nothing but estrellas. My spine fell out of my body and latched to the tree as my baby did to my breast. And when I cried, the tears came from both sides. The tears were saltier than the ocean. I didn't know this at the time, but they were also sweet. So that was the tale of La Llorona by Raquel Vasquez Gilliland. And, um, Raquel is just such an amazing artist and writer. Um, If you can see, if you're watching instead of listening, you can see the cover right now. Uh, This is her own artwork on the cover. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. She's going to be teaching on Saturday two classes, um, one of them on um, origin myths and using origin myths in your poetry. And um, and the workshops are already sold out, but if if you're in within driving distance of Southern California... Um, the Sunday reading, which features uh, Janet Fitch, um, Kim Dower, and Raquel Vasquez-Gillian, among other, other people, uh, is free and open to the public at Camp Maria Stella. 
So all you have to do is go to rightwoodlitfest.com for more information about that. We also have a poetry slam and um, um, a whole bunch of other events, including a children's workshop that Kim Dower is going to lead. We have a young poets competition. So kids, uh, you know, school age kids will be reading poems and uh, getting some awards there um, in addition to taking a class with Kim Dower. So if you have any kids and are close enough, uh, drive up and uh, check that out. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, today's poet is um, Al Ordolani. And, and Al Ordolani is really honestly one of my favorite poets. He um, is one of the best storytellers, I would say. He's the author of a whole bunch of books, and uh, I blurbed one of them, um, Paper Birds Don't Fly, which is one of the last books I blurbed. I don't really do blurbs anymore because it's just hard to keep up with all the requests. But um, about Paper Birds Don't Fly... I said that it reads like a road trip through the Midwestern mind. It's a long book of poems with room for many moods and musings that meanders through a landscape of humor and insight. Ordolani has packed all we need for the journey, a friendly voice, a bit of music, and the deft hand of a true storyteller guiding the wheel. And um, with this new book, uh, which you can see on the screen now, Hansel and Gretel Get the Word on the Street, Al Ordolani does the same kind of thing with um, his experience as a teacher. Uh, he's a retired teacher. Um, I think, it, if I remember right, it's 40 years he's been, he, he taught in uh, public schools, in high school. And this book is sort of, um, you know, little vignettes about, about the people who live there. And, and there's humor and wisdom, and it's a really entertaining book throughout. It came with this fall's issue of Rattle. Uh, there's Al on the screen right now. And let's, uh, let's bring Al in. Um, Hi, Al. You're on screen and, and on, on mic. Thank you, Tim. Uh, that was a nice introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, I want to thank Rattle and uh, Tim for making this possible for me. When, when Tim called me on the phone several months ago and told me, I guess a couple months ago, and told me that I had, was a winner in the contest, I thought maybe it was a prank call, uh, <laughs> and and I didn't quite hear him. And then uh, finally, I figured out oh, this is legit. I, I you know I'd met him before, and uh, and so I was very humbled uh, by that. Um, what I want to do tonight is to uh, take a look at some of the poems that people have very graciously about uh, over the past few weeks and uh, have commented on. And I may be giving a little background information as we go through this. Uh, I hope that's, hope that's helpful. And if uh, my cat should wander in and jump up on the computer, uh, just give me a second and we'll dislodge him. Uh, he likes to be the center of attention. And I have a poem about him in, in here somewhere in, in another grouping I may do. Uh, so let me start start with a poem called Eighth Grade Industrial Arts, which is actually uh, a poem from the point of view of a student. Now, this is a, an early poem uh, that deals with more of the experience that I would have had, or I actually did have as a student in eighth grade. And uh, I think a lot of the mentality in the poem, as well as some of the allusions, uh, are are dated. You'll probably see that. But what I found out uh, from other people was that uh, there were many who shared this experience. Eighth grade industrial arts. Shop class frightened him. The jigsaw, the planer, the lathe. Most of all, the teacher and his long double-strapped paddle that hung by the tool room door. He was frightened by the raw oak that he dreamed would become a bookshelf where he'd rest his favorite copies of Robin Hood and Tom Swift. Unlike Eric or Wayne, he couldn't see how to turn lumber into the photograph, page 87, in the shop text. From here to there was lost to him not unlike Latin or basketball or junior high girls. He feared everything in shop class, the noise of the jigsaw, the vibration of the blade, the proximity of his fingers to the cut. 
He feared his stupidity, his awkwardness with tools, the towering man with the paddle, who appeared to frown at his very existence, who took his misshapen boards out of his hands and in saving the boy from an F, screwed them together with thick, round-headed wood screws, then tossing it like a towel onto the shop table, wiped his hands clean on his navy apron. Um, yeah, that, uh, that, that's sort of my experience with industrial arts. And the, the interesting thing about it was after I taught for a while, the poem took on another angle. It was the angle of what would it have been like to have been <laughs> that teacher with 40 plus seventh and eighth grade boys around power tools. <laughs> and, and to me, I think he was very brave. And uh, I think uh, his sternness was, uh, I finally understood it, you know, as a teacher. <laughs> and, and, and interestingly enough, I had him in another class excuse me, a year later, there are only six or seven of us in the room. And this very stern, difficult teacher with the, the long paddle was a totally different guy. He would actually talk to us and laugh with us. And I thought, wow, he's a human being. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the forms that I've worked with the, in, in this book, uh, page 11, right next to eighth grade industrial arts is is the high bun. And this, uh, you, you may know a lot about the high bun, you may not. Uh, it's, it, it's a Japanese form that was made famous by uh, Basho during the 16th century, 17th century, I forget the exact dates, and in Japan. And he was, he was most known as a haiku poet. And his, uh, but when he traveled, he kept a prose uh, kind of travel log of where he went and what he saw. And he would, he would splice it together with these little haiku that would sort of elevate the prose to another level. Uh, like all American writers, we're very prone to, you know, making another form our own. And so we have experimented with taking the haiku uh, away from its three-line format and we're playing with one line we're playing with experimental arrangements of words and so it it's still a haiku you'll see at the end in in its purity or rather in its uh in its spirit that's the word i wanted uh, this one is called frozen and uh frozen i'll just read it there's not a bird in the sky a ninth grader walks the parking lot before school, his face a frozen fist. He shivers from the dead zero of the morning, hoodie pulled like a monk's cowl. He is earlier than the others, the building itself still unopened. Without my key card, how long would he wait for the door? When he shuffles past into the hallway, he mumbles the frozen hello. He saves for adults. Grasshopper in a jar leaping. Grasshopper in a jar leaping. When I put those uh, words together at the end for the haiku, um, it was, I had to play with that many times because uh, I was afraid that, but one, one editor, when I sent it off somewhere, told me that, the line uh, in a grasshopper in a jar leaping was jumbled together. So there must be something wrong with my formatting. <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, no, it's supposed to be that Well, way. to tell you the truth, uh, Ella, when I read this poem, when I read your manuscript, I still remember um, um, reading the manuscript. You know, I go through and they're, they're blind submissions. So I have no idea who uh, wrote anything. And I was laying on the couch behind me, like I always do reading uh, on my little tablet and when I got to Frozen, that was the, the, the point I thought, hey, this is probably one of the winners. <laughs> you know, three, three, four, three or four poems in. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, there's something I've been looking for a lot more lately. It's just um, things that are, that are positive and um, empathetic. 
And um, there seems to be such a darkness around poetry um, these days, yeah. you know, understandably in some respects and, and not, and maybe in others. Um, and, and one of the things I always love about your poems is that they're, they're, um, they're engaging in a way that's not dark. Um, and can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Is, there, is that a conscious thing that you do, or is that just your personality coming through? Well, as a teacher, you can't keep things dark. Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you have to be able to show uh, a little bit of uh, hope from the future mm -hmm. to these students. And, and, and secondly, kids don't let you stay dark because my students uh, always made me laugh uh, with their antics, or their, their, their comments, whether they were wise ass comments or just, you know, uh, commentaries on the world. You know, I couldn't help but smile. And, and so I think I tribute uh, my students for keeping me very positive. Uh, I had a, a mentor that I write about later, and, and she told me once that one of the hardest things in teaching was to remain positive, to keep a positive attitude towards you know the day in, day out. And, and I didn't get that at first. And after I taught for 20 years, I thought, damn, she's, she's telling yeah. the truth. Uh, you know, because you just get worn down. And it's not by the students, it's by, you know, the grind of a job, it's by, you know, the the accessories that go with teaching, you know, the, the meetings and, the, you know, the policies and, 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 and all of this. And so in poetry as well, uh, uh, I decided to, to try to find a way of making poems uh, positive. I, I don't, I don't do that all the time because some situations you just can't see the positivity in them mm. or the or any optimism. And, and but nonetheless, there has to be some, something there uh, for me to to look for. And, and so that was a conscious decision, okay. you know, some time mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you made it because really, you know, I, I I'm sure I don't get worn down in the same way that a, a teacher would. But reading submissions, like you kind of get worn down too. I mean, you, you know, you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just the. Uh, the darkness just overwhelms. And um, I think I've been thinking about it a lot. And I think maybe the problem is that, um, you know, poetry is a sort of form of problem solving. It's a kind of like yeah. right brain problem solving, like all art is. And uh, so if you you can't really write it and else you have a problem, which which leads to a yeah. lot of negativity just in general. And it's sort of yeah. hard to avoid that. So when you find a poet who, um, you know, is always manages to be engaging and then finding the light in, in, in the problems. Um, it's always something I, you know, my ears perk up and I really enjoy it. Well, the difficulty in being positive is you don't want to become syrupy sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, the trick. Cause, yeah. <laughs> cause, Cause that is not life. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe, maybe rarely, you know, and I, I, I do have a few syrupy sweet poems, but they don't go anywhere, you know, uh, the, the, the next poem I'll look at is one where I think uh, I use humor, sort of a ironic sarcasm, if anything, to try to keep uh, things light. S high school kids love sarcasm, and uh, they love uh, being a little bit profane at times, you know, and if you can roll with that, it, it enables them uh, expression, you know, because they're... They're in that stage of their lives where they're questioning everything the adults have done. But this is a poem about being a young teacher and not having a lot of time to work with kids. And it's called A Lesson About the Bonks, page 13. And uh, the bonks was a name I just pulled out of the air because it just sort of fit uh, for some reason. Uh, and it's about a conversation that a principal actually had with me. A lesson about the bonks. One day while on lunch duty, the principal presses up to me and says, now I've seen it all. The two bonk boys absent all morning have just arrived in time for their free or reduced lunch. Watch them disappear before the next bell rings. Mom and dad are both sitting outside in the car it's a cycle, the way families move in this part of the county, just ahead of the bill collectors. The bonks will be gone next month, and we won't see them again until spring or fall. I can't blame the kids for the dumbass parents who raised them, but the cycle needs broken. 
and you, young teacher with the fresh bachelor's degree, have got to snap it. Add some literacy. Teach the bonks to read. You got maybe two months. That was an eye opener for me. And and the principal, uh, a good man, one of the best principals I ever worked under. He uh, he didn't have the answer, you know, to the problem, and yet he was a career teacher. Um, I used the word in this book bonehead a few times. Uh, I never used that with my students, uh, you know, unless it was unless we were, you know. Uh, obviously joking with one another. On page 14, there's one that originally was a sonnet, and uh, I kind of lost the rhyme, the end rhyme, as I worked with the poem to make, make it fresher. But we used to teach a, a class, I think many school districts still have it, it was, it was like a study hall, and it was called seminar, and it was a class where you could move around and the students could leave a class, their seminar teacher, and go to another room and maybe get tutoring, maybe get uh, work with another group of kids in, in a small group. And one day my door opens up and this boy walks in. And of course I watched him. It's called At Risk in Bonehead English. Sudden snow blew from the north like a thin, crisp mistake. White and crystalline, more powder than flake. Lacking in depth of grace or beauty, it lay as an indig indignant sheet of winter, a threat to the crocus unfolding below the maple. Perhaps ice turns me cold in the classroom, focused on the boy who walks in without a pass. Excuse me, focused on the boy who runs in without a pass to visit the mouthy girl by the window. The one whose name is scrawled on desks. He chews jaw muscles bursting under pale, thin skin. His eyes dart across the room, ready to challenge even winter. And I, I'd see these tough kids, you know, when I worked with at risk students, and, uh, you know, they were, you were the man, you know, and they would come in and just ready for you to. They were ready for confrontations, you know, and so the goal was to sort of de-escalate that before it even started, you know. Um, my mentor on page 17, she used to, uh, she was really tired. She was in her 60s. I was a younger teacher and <clears throat> she would, uh, during planning periods, the kids would be out of her room and she would lock the door, turn out the lights and, and lay down on the floor a little bit. And I, I knew she was, you know, having some poor health issues and she would have me make sure she didn't oversleep. And so, so I would stay in my room and then occasionally slip over to, you know, to wake her up before the bell rang. And I, I call this corpse pose and I wrote the poem. I was needing to do the same thing. And, and, and so I was the worn out teacher. I was remembering her situation. Corpse pose. Faculty meeting. I locked my door, turn out the light and close my eyes on the floor. There was a colleague who used to nap planning period. She was old and tired. I kept an eye on the clock for her, making sure that she was up five minutes before the bell. She said she needed to be recomposed before she decomposed. Students start to swarm the hallways. One rattles my doorknob. If my feet are visible, sticking out from under my desk like a body under a dumpster. Well, the school nurse burst into the room with the resource officer. How do I explain this yoga corpse during a faculty meeting? Then no one comes. And that in itself is a lonely thought. I unlock the classroom door, high five the first students through. So there you have the situation of feeling a bit down and negative and burned out. And, and yet when the students come in, you've got to rise. And, and I always like to high five them when they came in. And it got me fired up. And then I was alive again, you know. Um, 
page uh, 18. I had this young colleague a few years ago, and she was a wonderful young teacher, and I watched her grow. And we were across the hallway from each other, and I could watch her uh, just really come at ease with her students and, and create an enjoyable classroom where a lot of learning took place. And I was <clears throat> walking by her room one day, and I heard her talking about Theodore Rethke. And they were reading the poem that's used on a number of the AP tests, um, and I just went blank on it, uh, My Father's Waltz. And if you haven't read that poem, uh, look it up and read it. It's a, it's a beautiful poem. <clears throat> Mrs. W. explains Rethke to AP English. If they'd seen a waltz, they'd never danced one. Oh, they knew the word, like we might know the words pan flute or bacchanalia. So when I heard Miss W's fifth hour go dumb as wall paste, the definition vague and untendered, I stepped into the classroom and held out my arms. She took my left hand and I slipped my right around her back, keeping safe distance. We began to waltz the room. At first, bumping into desks, the trash can, a computer printer, then finding space built into a rhythm that allowed the one, two, three, one, two, three to swing. The class laughed as we laughed. A moment of clowning turned graceful, one they'd recall in posts and tweets. But for Rethke, I said as we stopped, and I brushed one student's desk free of books and papers. His father had been drinking. He slammed into the world with a belt buckle. Mrs. Do Miss W. stepped onto my shoes, and I, would have careened, and I would have careened around the room as if with my daughter, except that I couldn't lift my feet. Give him your sober countenance, she said, as we bent and swayed in imitation, one that cannot unfrown itself. Some got the point staring at their knuckles on a page. In that, in that poem, the character uh, bruises his, scrapes his knuckles on his father's belt buckle as they are gallivanting around the room. And that's, uh, that was a great moment for me. We just had a, a, just a good laugh from the whole thing. Um, let's talk about springtime for a minute. I taught largely seniors. I just friggin' loved them. You know, that was a great age. I taught college and uh, two, and I taught upper level research methods and all this stuff. And I did that, you know, as, as an adjunct. It kind of kept me in beer money. Um, <clears throat> did that in the evenings. But what I really enjoyed most were high school students because you got to know them so much better. And it was more like you had a community in your room and especially with seniors because they would really bond with as they saw their time in this world they had grown up in starting to end. It was it was a both a wonderful time for them and a very frightening time. You know, one girl, I remember one day uh, saying, you know, I think I'm going to die. I said, why would you say that? And she goes, well, because next year, she's like, I can't imagine my life. And I've always been able to imagine. My and we, we talked about that. And she realized she, she was, you know, half joking. But at the same time, I understood that anxiety. Yeah. You know, yeah. page 20, the class that would not eat. And one thing about seniors, uh, in, in this area, at least, I'm assuming it's true all over the country, um, uh, after spring break, they're pretty well done. I mean, especially with AP students. I mean, these guys were great students, and they'd done everything right. And by spring break, they were done. They knew they were graduating. <laughs> they were accepted. They were accepted to colleges, and they would try to coast right out the door. And learning just diminished. It was so frustrating because I had a lot of stuff I wanted to cover still. And so my approach sometimes, would, rather than ruin our whole relationship. I would simply say, try to learn one thing today, okay? <laughs> Just one thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And they, they got it. The class that would not 
eat. Fourth hour goes bonehead in spring. I'd say they're selectively bright. Occasionally I have to take the host of knowledge and lay it on their tongues. And even then on bad days, it just falls out from between their teeth onto the gray carpet. I swear they are clumsy learners. History, math, the sciences are dribbled across their school spirit wear like baby effluvia, Melba toast crumbs, spittle. They explain to me in their polite way that old literature is too boring to swallow, much less digest. They want the outsiders or Harry Potter, both of which were ladled out in eighth grade. Fifty shades of gray, one girl laughs. I offer them the Canterbury Tales, a slice of Middle English on black bread. This is something you would not choose for yourselves. The taste promotes, promotes menu literacy, and that too makes no sense to them. They regurgitate it as fast as I can spoon it in. You are picky eaters. You are picky learners. I say at last. No peas, no carrots, just chicken fingers, slathered in ketchup, a Starbucks latte topped with whipped cream. Let, let me ask you something, this, Al. Um, yeah, yeah. The thing I always want to ask, uh, you know, veteran teachers is how are kids doing these days? Um, <laughs> I, it is just such a crazy world now. Um, and uh, it's so different than even when I was in, you know, I was thinking about my high school senior year when you were talking about that. And I, I coasted through too, and that was 20 years ago. And the world is so different now. Um, and then, you know, there's that whole, um, idea of the Flynn effect where people are getting smarter every year too. And that continues. Um, and, and the world gets more complicated. Um, so, so yeah. are the kids all right? That's what I want to, that's what I want to ask. How are kids doing these days? Well, I think, uh, I think they're good. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think the only world they know is the world they're in. The thing that frustrated me, uh, was the fact that there's so much to teach them. I mean, where, mm -hmm. where do I begin as a teacher? Uh, especially with literature. I mean, where does intro to literature begin? Uh, how far back in history do I go to teach British lit, for instance? Uh, but I think more of what you mean there is uh, how are they in terms of attentiveness, in terms of positivity, mm -hmm. in terms of having goals, et cetera? How are they coping? Exactly, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and I think very well. I, I think they're louder in some respects because they have, you know, uh, they have so many more social media sources they can tag on to. Uh, and so they make, maybe make more noise when they do screw up when they do. And, and yes, the world is confusing to them. Uh, my age, we pass notes, uh, in the classroom. These guys are texting, you know, they're still kids and they're pulling kid pranks. Um, uh, if you're a substitute teacher, you're kind of fair game, you know, and that was true in my generation. It's true now. Um, and the teachers who engage students, uh, are still very necessary. Um, I see all this is, is basically the same. I don't see them as changing. I see education as going through a difficult time now, especially with, with technology, because we're, we're always a step behind, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to keep up with it. And, and that's very difficult. And for older teachers, uh, it's really hard to, to stay abreast of the technological changes. You know, I was sort of a chalkboard guy mm -hmm. and I never really got much beyond that. Um, kids are just so much more advanced at grabbing that stuff and running with it. I mean, they're just quicker. They don't know anything mm -hmm. else. They're, they've grown, you know, they've grown up with it. Um, do they have issues? Yeah, they do. Yeah, you know, they really do. Uh, my generation had issues. It's a hard one to say. Is it worse? Is it is it better? You know, I can't say that it's better. I'm not sure it's mm -hmm. any worse. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know if that answers no, the question. No, it does. It's, I'm it's, just always 
curious about that because because I think we're we're probably yeah. in the in the age of the most rapid change in the history of the human race, and and oh, yeah. we it's really hard to keep up. I mean, th- this technology that we're using right now to do this live stream wasn't available, you know, four <laughs> years ago. I think um, you know, yeah. so yeah. Uh, it's, it's just incredible the way that that things transition and, and how much you have to understand to to move forward in the world now. Well, you find yourself educating kids on things you never thought you'd be educating them on, like, for instance, the use of the phone in the classroom. Uh, you know, it, that can be a battle if you want to take it on and fight it every day uh, or develop some sense of, of approach to it that will work for you and with, with that given group. Like with AP kids, you could say things like, uh, okay, y'all got your phones out. Let me talk to you about manners. Mm-hmm. And they'd all, they'd all stop and look and I'd say, you know, uh, let's assume I really prepared this lesson really hard, and they'd all laugh. You're like, sure you did. You know, okay, look, I really did. Uh, but here I spent my time on this, and now you're looking at your phone. You know, how's that going to affect me when I look at you doing this? And the, they got it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and, yeah. and they were open to that. So it's, you know, and teachers are on their phones during faculty meetings. You know, and <laughs> it's it's sort of there's sort of a hypocrisy. That there, you know, uh, but I was that guy too. So you know, mm-hmm. and then, so there, that's what you're dealing with. You know, it's just a, it, it's a. It, some of the battle is new, but some of it's very old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, my father-in-law used to have very, very good answers. I mean, very simple answers like you got to have, you got to force the rules. You know that kind of thing and. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's not as simple as that, but you know, it, it, it it's not a simple fix. Mm-hmm. It never has been, never has been. Yeah. Um, let me look at a poem that's outside of a little bit outside of teaching here with, uh, into the coaching realm. Uh, I don't know how much of my time I'm using and I like got some other poems I'd like to go to, yeah, but if we, we stay on We have about this, uh, 20 minutes left. So, so, Plenty of time. Okay, let me let me do a couple more from this book, and then we'll uh, move to some other poems. Because uh, let me look at one called Game Prayer, page twenty-four. This is one that was commented on by a few. And I grew up in a coaching environment. My father was an athletic trainer at Pittsburgh State University, and uh, as well as an Olympic trainer. And uh, so football, for instance, was always very big. That and baseball. And this is called Game Prayer. And it's, it's about that prayer that the boys say before they go out into the field in the locker room. Maybe it's the way boys look at each other before the last game, their eyes wet and glimmering with rain. Maybe it's that I catch them in these shy moments of waiting turning the world like a pigskin, flipping it nonchalantly, low spiral, drilling the air. Maybe it's this moment before the splash of lights, before the game prayer, before you run from the door. If so, forgive me for seeing you so vulnerable in that quiet moment before the helmets. Uh, the last one I'll do here, um, well, I got several I could do. Uh, let me do Drug Dog Visit. It's kind of humorous, page 32. And one thing that's different about schools today is we do have the drug dogs that wander through the building. And uh, if I had a class of seniors, they usually brought the drug dog by my classroom Uh because you know the seniors had been around the longest, they were the ones that probably were in the partying scene. And they, the thing that always amazed me was we had very good police resource officers in every school I've been in, and they became, I think, uh, very, uh, and most of them became very good resource people for the students. I mean, these guys, the kids, felt they could talk to them to a certain extent. Drug dog visit. We were, oh, and let me frame this a little better. We were studying Kafka. Drug dog visit. The police dog sniffs through the building today. He barks outside my classroom. The cop, knowing my students, laughs as they stiffen in their seats. 
Soon they relax. Officer Smith's just messing with us, they explain. Well, it's a good thing you left your grass at home, I joke. The boys laugh again. That isn't the half of it, one says. I don't want to know the half of it. So I say, let's get back to your Kafka. They lower their heads and try to make sense of Gregor, who, as a dung beetle, keeps himself shyly tucked under a couch rather than terrifying the streets. What's with this hiding, they ask. A dung beetle could be as cool as Ant-Man. He could hook up with the wasp. And so, you know, these guys are always doing this kind of stuff to me. Uh, and I'll do the last one. I, that was my last one, but I got, I got the same boys, okay? And it's called Shopping for Fruit, page 34. And this is about a pun that came out of the class one day. And it, I don't know how it even showed up, but it did. And uh, these guys were, sometimes these guys were hard to say no to and hard to discipline because they always made me laugh. But uh, it's shopping for fruit. Melancholia, I asked the class of 17-year-olds. One boy just outside the T-zone answers, a fruit. And I had to laugh. Yes, probably in the produce section at High V, you got the, you've got the honeydew, the cantaloupe, the melancholia. Melon Kalia, most likely priced higher than the watermelon, so germane to family picnics, ice cream socials, class reunions. The melon Kalia ripens slowly on vines of discontent. It is only purchased by the disillusioned when the fruit bin has been emptied of choices. But I keep this cherry to myself. These boys haven't done much pro done much produce shopping. They still find bananas amusing. So I will stop on the book with that one. Uh, I appreciate you guys listening. If you want me to go back to it later, I will. Or if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, that's a good, a good, uh, a good transition. Um, if you, I should say, uh, if anybody wants a copy of Hansel and Gretel, uh, get the word in the street. This, uh, this book from Eller Delani, winner of uh, one of the three winners of the 2019 Rattle Chat Book Prize. Um, all you have to do is subscribe to Rattle uh, in the next like two months, and this will come with your subscription automatically. With uh, it's shipped along with the fall issue, so uh, so hope you enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, let's look at some uh, different poems, Al. Um, let's go to uh, the poem "Kisser," and this one's for you, oh, Tim, <laughs> because because you're a baseball fan. And uh, I'm trying to remember which book it's in. I think it's in uh, this book from the NYQ, New York Quarterly Press. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a baseball story which plays with the word kisser because a kisser is obviously uh, your lips. It's being kissed by something. It is kissing something. And my father used to use it, you know, uh, and, and you'll see how he used it. But this is about the 1960 or 61 World Series when the Yankees were playing the Pittsburgh Pirates. It was known as the Quebec Series, the Tony Quebec Series. Uh, Quebec was hit by a, a ground ball that was routine. It should have been a double play. It gets hit by on his throat and his Adam's apple, and that changed the whole effect of the game. The Yankees were winning. I was the only Yankee fan in Kansas and after afterwards I was crushed kisser no time for self-pity on a baseball diamond with so many dusty ground balls short hopping the infield sometimes you have little more to respond to than a quick crack of the bat if for even a second you take your eye off the ball you're flattened the hot shot smacking you in the kisser. And then there you are lying on your back alone between second and third, adrenaline pumping the other dugout cheering. You remember Tony Kubek down by a pebble being carried from the field in Pittsburgh, the fifth grade boys crying into their gloves, cussing Bill Mazeroski when he's the ball in the ninth. And that was the home run that ended the game, and I was brokenhearted. 
I was probably the only boy really crying into my glove. Uh, let's look at the poem Asphalt. In going through college, I had to do a lot of temporary jobs, you know, summers as most of us do. And uh, I got emails from this poem uh, from guys who had also worked asphalt. And uh, they agreed with just about everything in it. Um, asphalt. The road crew hired temps between semesters to stand beside the hopper shoveling. The foreman disliked college students. He never learned our names, referenced us, referenced us by the tools we carried. Skip and I were shovels, scraping the hot mix into the conveyor. Ronnie, the college dropout, is a rake. He followed the paver, flicking the screed ridge to a smooth seam. All summer, I shoveled the city streets, made do with whatever shade I could catch. Each day at five, we cleaned the tools with diesel and putty knives. Then we sprayed our boots, kicking our teal steel toes against a bar of rail line. We wagged with the diesel and scrubbed our hands and faces. Then I drove home, a towel on the seat, another on the armrest. I hung my work clothes on the fence behind the house. They appeared capable of walking off on their own. I lost my identity that summer. I was no longer Al. I was Shovel, and that was a le that was a lesson. <clears throat> Let's go to Taco Boat. This is one I'm always asked to read uh, by one guy, H.C. Uh, Palmer, a doctor here and poet here in Kansas City. Uh, the taco boat. You got it there, Tim? Last night I bought a 12-pack of tacos at Taco Bell, not because I was especially hungry, but because I could. My ship had come in, you see, and, and for once I was rolling in it. I ate six of them in front of the television while binging on episodes of some Netflix series not because it was particularly engaging, but simply because I could. My ship, if you recall, had come in. I backed up, I packed up the other six tacos and brought them to work for lunch, where my fellow employees marveled or laughed. I couldn't tell which, yet my ability to eat six soggy tortillas microwaved in their wrappers and spread like dollar bills on the table. I gave one to a friend and she was happy. Happy for the taco, happy for me, happy for everyone who waited for a boat, any boat, to come in. I live in the suburbs in Kansas City, but it's, we're on the edge of KC, and uh, the town, uh, the city is spreading, and it's engulfing the, the surroundings, and there was this one little holdout farm on 87th Street that remained a farm even as all the fast food and strip, strip malls moved around it. And I call this the last farm on 87th Street. A few head of black, black Angus stare dumbly at traffic. At dusk, as the talk Twilight drains behind Taco Bell, a woman jogs in a reflective suit. The cattle become silhouettes. Gradually, the night slips between the house and the barn like cold, dark silk. Cattails, clumped at the pond's edge, are swept by lights, by the lights of a semi on the interstate. This is loneliness. The empty seat of the tractor, the shed's open door, the winter air and deepening darkness. Nothing levies the flood of change. A bucket hangs on the water pump. When we were kids, let's go to Cemetery as Dog Park. When we were kids, uh, 
we used to go to the cemetery and hang out because <laughs> it was nobody would nobody would go there and except you know the the bereaved and we could play and uh, it was it was a place to get away from little brothers and sisters and you know we could just you know sit sit in the in the bushes and talk deep thoughts and I call this cemetery as dog park. We always had a dog with us. Sunday afternoon, a cold gray nips the air, the same gray that drove us as boys to the cemetery where sheltered in the evergreens, protected from the wind, we planned our futures, one dog or another panting at our feet. 50 years is a long time for boys, an impossibility for dogs, a big nothing for the sun. Even the cold creeping slowly into our thighs is as temporary as juniper berries, bagworms, sprawling limbs. Memory comes and goes as we count the winners, the dogs that licked their balls, chewed our shoes, ran into traffic like happy fools. Let's go to a, a gardening poem. The summer's almost over, but my gosh, we can still eat, eat those tomatoes. Let's go to growing tomatoes. This one's a little different uh, for me. I don't know why. It just seemed uh, more homespun. Growing tomatoes is a lot like waiting for Jesus. Each day you pull up the lawn chair next to your six leggy plants. The yellow blossoms and a few green vegetables droop outside the wire cages. You've tied them with white rags, a surrender bowed to the soil. Dusted with seven, they should be free of aphids. You're not an organic farmer. You're not a far farmer at all. You slice tomatoes well, and that's about it. You like them salted and spiced with chili peppers. It is June. You have weeks to wait. An asteroid could hit by then. If you leave now, you could be at a roadside stand in Arkansas by sunset. Surely someone is harvesting more than hope. What I got, Tim? About two or three minutes oh. left? About five minutes. Um, let me let me ask you. Uh, we haven't really talked about your background as a poet yet. Uh, how did how did you get into poetry? I'm always curious about that too. Have you did you always love poetry, or is it something you came to later? And uh, and who do you think were the influential poets? That because you have a very distinctive style. Um, so who who influenced that? Well, I came to poetry as a little boy actually because my mother was an English major, who who quit college to to raise kids and. She used to read to me uh, the poems of, uh, uh, of like, like the highwaymen, uh, and, and I could hear the rhythms, you know, that she would read with good narrative long poems. Uh, my father, as a, my father was the storyteller. He always had great stories, uh, and, and so I, I was kind of brought up in that environment of literature and uh, and just sort of organic storytelling that was usually humorous. Um, I became a, I started writing because uh, I couldn't get the attention of any girls, and uh, in high school, and <laughs> I would I would lock myself in the bathroom to get away from all the siblings in the house, and I would write poems about the girls that I that didn't know I existed. And they were, they were, I'm sure they were really bad, sappy poems, but I had the, a one teacher I could share everything with and, and she, she liked them and uh, it made a difference to me. And I think the cool thing was, is that I liked writing them. I felt good while writing, mm -hmm. even if they, you know, even if, even if the poems, you know, sucked as poems. And, and so I wanted to go back to that again and again and again. And then. And when I had to go to college, I had to declare a major, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I said English, and I did. And <clears throat> one thing led to the next. My influences, wow, that's a hard one. Uh, I would say uh, 
David Bottoms was a big influence when I started reading his narrative poems. They just took my head off. Uh, Seamus Heaney, I got to meet once, and uh, I, he he blew me away with his his storytelling ability and his it made me wish I had an Irish brogue. And I, you know, I, in fact, the whole time I sat with him, I, I really couldn't talk to him. I, I didn't know what to say. It was all, you know, I just anyway. Uh, those are two that come to mind. Uh, I like anybody who, who can tell a good story, you know, uh, and, and a lot of times it's it's the poet of the moment. Oh, well, Billy Collins mm-hmm. uh, is amazing, and uh, he, he just blows me away with the things he pulls out of his hat to write about. And I've got a poem about Billy Collins that maybe someday I'll share, but I'm going to probably share it with him first where I, I'm actually kind of pissed off at him because he, come, he comes up with such good poems that I really wished I had thought of first, you know? Yeah. We have, uh, we have more poems about Billy Collins than any other poet. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> why am I There's, not surprised? Like about, about being jealous of Billy Collins, about how to, um, yeah, you know how to write yeah. a poem like Billy Collins. I think there's like four four poems with Billy Collins in the title that we published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's how I kind of came to it, and that's who I kind of read. I uh, I've had a pretty classical background, but I was um, going to a small college in Kansas, uh, Pittsburgh State University. I had amazing English instructors who really you know, brought literature to life mm-hmm. for me. And one guy in particular, Michael Heffernan, who's a instructor at, uh, retired, I believe now, in, in, in Arkansas, and Joe McDougall, another Arkansas poet, both who came to our school in Pittsburgh. And, and uh, they brought in people for us to meet, you know, like Ginsburg mm-hmm. and, uh, and, 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 uh, the, the, the greats of that time, Howard Nimeroff and so on, uh, as well as Seamus Heaney. And, and they just, not only was I able to read these things, but I was able to meet these people. And that just, you know, to me, that was huge. And I can't thank those two enough for that. Um, did that kind of answer that question a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely did. Thanks so much, Al. Uh, do you want to read like one more poem to finish this out? Yeah, I'll read one more poem to finish this out. And uh, let me read uh, let me read Butterfly Valve. Uh, it's it's a poem for my father because uh, my dad was the uh, you know the he, he bought more pieces of crap cars than anybody on earth. Uh, because we, you know, he was a teacher. We were living on a teacher's salary, five kids, and uh, you know that's what we had. And so this is a poem about him and the butterfly valve being that little piece on the carburetor that uh, you know allows the gas intake and the air intake to mix correctly. I'm probably saying that wrong because I'm not a mechanic. Butterfly valve. Wiring the exhaust pipe to the frame of the truck is a skill I learned from my father. He could keep a piece of shit, Ford or Chevy or Plymouth, running without repairs longer than anyone I knew. It was kind of a gift to himself, keeping cash from the mechanic for as long as possible. He'd make do with a leaking gas tank by not topping it off or avoid a 60-mile-per-hour front-end shimmy by driving 55. As his children moved away into lives of their own, the money ran more freely. He gave up lying on the street with his shoulders wedged under the chassis. He scheduled regular automobile checkups where he'd sit out in the shop with the wrench turners and tell stories about how he used to keep his junkers running with bailing wire heated with cardboard in front of the radiator, ignited with ether, a screwdriver wedged in the throat of the carburetor. He was my hero. I kept... wrote that poem one night, one afternoon, lying under the, uh, under, on the concrete, looking up mm-hmm. at my muffler on my old truck, <laughs> thinking, I got to keep this thing running. You yeah, know? yeah. That's one of those poems from Rattle. 
I don't know which issue it was in. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, but that that it that uh, screwdriver yeah. wedged in the throat of the carburetor is such a such a memorable image. I think of that if if I see the see the name Al Ortolani, I think of that that image pops into my head. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, so thanks so much, Al. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we had about two dozen people watching live. We'll have a lot of people more more people watching later. But uh, but people really loved it. Um, People mentioned they love your reading voice and uh, love your your shirt too. So I should say that <laughs> out loud. It says, "Metaphors be with you." So <laughs> I picked this I picked this up at, in Venice Beach and uh, down at Beyond Baroque when I was visiting. Oh, you really? A couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, and I thought I got to have this. Shirt yeah, that's here. great. Great. Well, thanks so much, Al. It's been a real pleasure, uh, and looking forward to to seeing what you do next. Okay, man. Thank you. Yeah, very have much. a good one. I'll talk yep, to you later. Bye. So that was Al Ortolani, uh, one of the, one of my favorite poets. I, you know, if you pick up any of his books, uh, he's just such a great storyteller, and he has so many stories uh, that uh, he can really fill them up. So, uh, p- so pick up any of his books. I think he has about oh gosh, at least like a half dozen. Um, so now we are going to um, move on to the open mic portion. I have four people who have asked to um, to read over Skype. And we also have uh, about, I think we're probably only going to do three uh, pre-recorded poems. But, um, but as always, if you'd like to, if you'd still like to do the, the live uh, Skype open mic, uh, give me a text message to Rattle Poetry right now, and I will reply to you over message and then uh, uh, call you back when the timing is right for the show. I should say, too, while everybody's still here, um, please do click the like button and tell all your friends to subscribe and all that if you enjoyed this this uh, episode. Uh, it's always helpful to get those like clicks and get the subscriptions because that's how YouTube and all these social media type platforms spread stuff around and we want to be spreading poetry around. So please help us out in that way and tell all your friends and share it through social media and that would uh, really be great. Let's see. Um, I think to start... Let me see what I have here. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll call somebody to start. Um, let's call. Let's see. There was somebody here who hadn't been on before, and that's Joy Coulter. So I'm going to call Joy Coulter right now. And uh, you can't hear it, but for me, the the ringtone's playing in my ear. Later, when this becomes an audio-only podcast, I will delete this uh, part. Ah, Joy Coulter. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to bring you in in just a second. Uh, click off on the YouTube so so there's no echo, and uh, I'll bring you in in just a moment. Let's see. Um, we're going to do this quick. Ah, so so Joy Coulter, you're on. We have you on on the line now, right now. Your your video and audio look good. Uh, where are you calling us from? I'm. Uh, you can hear me. I can hear you. Yep, yep. You're okay. live online. Thanks so much. Uh, I am calling from Rock Hill, South Carolina. It is 10:05 p.m. over here. I live about a half hour away from the North South Carolina border. Mm-hmm. So I'm about a half hour away from Charlotte. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much for calling in. Uh, what do you have for us today? Uh, the name of this poem is Fashion Statement. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Fashion Statement. The secret to the style. The smeared on smile. A glossy red to make teeth glistening white. Reflects what friends prefer to see in me. A genteel woman hailed as full of grace. The Lord with me to bless me into bliss. Some flats, black skirt, white blouse, and done up do complete the packaged me. But know the key in locking down the look lies in the lips to help the spoken word divert, distract my listeners from the truth my welled up eyes would rather let be written on my face. You're gone, not here with me. And now my soul is heavy, 
being emptied of the weight your presence made. This sucks. It hurts like hell. I love you. Now I can't show how or why. I miss you and the me I was with you. God, what I'd give to feel the way I look. Well, thanks so much, Joy. That was great. Uh, great, great performance of the poem, too. Thanks so much for calling in and sharing that. Um, Thank you, sir. Yeah, I hope you call in again. Please do. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Have a good night. Okay, so that was uh, that was Joy Coulter from South Carolina. Uh, and I, I have a couple more people lined up on Skype. But first, let's do uh, Kevin Keeley. He is an Irish poet who I meant to... Uh, get to last week and we ran out of time so let's make sure we get him in before we do anything else um so this is a let me find his bio kevin keely is a poet critic and fulbright scholar in creative writing um um, he's uh has a very rich bio let's see um he's I, I don't know, I don't want to read all these awards. There's so many awards. So so he's a very uh, award-winning poet. And his website is Kevin Keeley. That's you can see it right here. Kevin Keeley dot net. That's Keeley is uh, K-I-E-L-Y dot net. And he's gonna read Conjure Up. To Conjure Up. Here he is. To Conjure Up by Kevin Kiley. I went absent, leaving you for Chicago. The hotel became a hospital. I signed my committal form at reception. At the Sears Tower, in the elevator, a silver-walled room powered by jet engines, thrust me with strangers to the 110th floor. From this height, through the windows, the lights in the towers of the city, moving lights of traffic, and street lights still, far below. A snowy cloud passed across the window, dimming the scene of the black and the lights and the towers with you missing. I can only conjure you up. And then I said, I will give you all of this city below us from this mad height. If you bow down and adore me. I bow down and adore you by the waters of Lake Michigan, breaking and breaking in waves without salt. And she said, I will bow down and adore you. So I gave her the city with pleasure. I gave her the city of Chicago. So that was Kevin Keeley from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I love the slow pace that he read with. I always read my poems too fast. People always tell me that. I talk too fast, too. I try uh, on these podcasts, I'm trying not to talk too fast, but I can't help it. Um. Let's go to another open mic caller. I'm going to do the people who um, haven't called in before first. And um, let's see. So here we go. Um, I want to...
Hi. I am calling from New York City. Absolutely. I'm originally from uh, Oklahoma, so, you know, I'm a normal person. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so... Um, all right. Yeah, so so we have Carrie Radna here on the line, um, and what do you have for us today? Um, well, I have something from um, my uh, my latest chapbook, uh, "Remembering You as I Go Walking," and um, it's it's called "Lucky Stars Afternoon Colors." Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay, here we go. Part one. Miss the good luck given on this holy Irish holiday of days while stuck rehearsing in Riverdale with quiet singing Jews, not blessed with the knowledge of reading music. Come on, unicorn girl. You created your rainbows for blue stars blessed by David. At least green is still your favorite color. After all, the red-faced clover dancers took off their tap shoes and went to bed. But my man needs to work. So I plan to steal away to Roosevelt Island after Purim rehearsal before the setting sun spun its gold out when the blue hour peaks and the moon peeks out in the silver haze. No, I didn't make it to the island tonight. Tyrannus crept in and took hold instead. It was but a sweet, weak old dream. Part two. Patterns and towers hover by as I circled the island by foot. I blamed a tint on my sunglasses on turning the fl fr Friday afternoon light into the perfect shade of blush pink. Hazy clouds now resemble a young five-year-old ballerina's tutu. And the brickwork on apartment buildings get glow a fierce salmon pink thanks to the sun. The Queensboro Bridge turned butter yellow by the time I first saw the tramway. Not yet. I was almost run over by a giant black and white spotted hound with huge jowls who stopped to lick his ball sack. His cute owner apologized with a wordless shrug. I chased the pink light towards the octagon, freshly mowed in spring green, but still closed for the season. The light is now fading. I took off my shades, and then the pink clouds instantly faded into a silvery gray. <laughs> The blue hour brought forth sexy shadows, lapping in the water as I walked along the East River. The lights upon the bridge lit the narrow talons and towers. They remind me of toothpicks. My dad and I once built a bridge made out of toothpicks when I was 11. I cannot imagine him being here with me now, even here in this quiet, floating hamlet. He would pronounce this place as too urban for him. Well, too bad, Dad. I enjoy these places, like I'm enjoying my golden heart roll with two pieces of salmon sushi and some seaweed salad decorated with a purple orchid. On Roosevelt Island, the colors of the afternoon dance in my mind like a breathing tapestry. Now lucky, after the day is done, the big red R.I. tram takes us all home. The lights of Manhattan pierce the dark with white, blue, and gold stars and boxes illuminated. That's it. Well, thank you, Carrie Radna. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that poem with us. And then you're holding yeah. up the chapbook, Remembering You. Who published that again? Where, where can people find it? Uh, well, you could uh, let me know. It's uh, on Boxwood Star Press, which is my press. Ah, okay. Yes. And, um, oh, fun fact, that the, this... Um, illustration mm -hmm. i took it when i was on that tram ah very cool yeah. well thanks so. thanks so much uh yeah yeah it showed up great uh, thanks so much for for calling and uh and sharing that poem with us and, and hope uh people check out your chat is there like a website or something though people can go to uh not yet but 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 i'll, I'll let you guys know okay awesome yeah please do please call in again that was a lot of fun thanks so much great. yeah great, great.
Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Yep. Bye. Yep. See you later. Bye. Okay, so uh, that was Carrie Radna. Uh, let me try another Skype caller. Um, let's see. Let's do Emilio Puerta because he was not on last week. And as always, uh, sorry if I, um, you know, don't un forget to unmute the uh, the microphone button. I have to mute it, or else you'll hear me typing. And uh, sometimes I forget for a little bit to unmute it. But um, so Emilio Puerta. Hello. Ah, Emilio Puerta. You're already on. Somehow you just automatically popped in, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you're already here. Uh, say hi to everybody. Hello. That, that's uh, really cool. So I found, I figured out the way to not have that big delay, which is, it, there's a little setting, which I did a little differently by accident, and it kind of worked perfectly. So we have uh, Emilio Puerta here. Uh, once again, he's called in a couple times before, and uh, what do you have for us today? He's calling from Toronto, Canada, I should say. Yep. Um, so what do you have for us today, Amelia? So I have another – so I should say something that I, that I have not said uh, before that I should have. Um, I do have a self-published uh, collection out. Oh, great, on, yeah. On Amazon, and all the poems that I've read so far are, are in the collection, mm -hmm. including, including this one that, that I'm going to have to read uh, right now. I'm about to read. So um, it can also be found on my, on my blog, writerscafe.org slash M E P O M I E M I Poem I. So E M I P O E M I. Mm -hmm. And this one is it's a favorite among the crowd just because of the performance of it. Mainly. But it's also fun. And it's called Reincarnations. Great. Mm -hmm. If I could any animal become post mortem I would like to be a fish and drift about low tides and high. They'll lure you with their baited hooks. They'll trap you in their trawls. They'll steer you in their pots and pans and stick your scales on shawls. If I could any animal become postmortem, I would like to be a bird and fly across the boundless sky. They'll fell and devastate your home. They'll taint and blight your air. They'll strip you of your feathering to stuff the wind to wear. If I could any animal become postmortem, I would like to be a deer and run through thicket, blade and rye. They'll blind and they blind you with their beaming lights. They'll limit where you roam. They'll hunt you on Thanksgiving Day and ha and hang your head at home. If I could any animal become postmortem, I would like to be a cat and dwell with comfort ever by. They'll carelessly, strip st they'll carelessly step on your tail. They'll seldom heed your muse. They'll amputate your private parts and poke you as you snooze. Then there's not any animal without a threat in life. Not even humans are exempt from hazards, harm, and strife. Thus, if by any animal become postmortem, I would merely want to be with you. For then, I'll never die. Well, thank you, Emilio Porta. Uh, thanks so much for calling again and, and reading that poem. What's the name of your chapbook again? One more time, so that uh, people know. It's a full length. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I know, sorry. I have yeah. chapbooks on the brain tonight. We <laughs> we fe <laughs> we feature two chapbooks, so I'm just is it's everything is a chapbook to me right now. So so uh, what's the name of the book? I should say. I've been writing for eleven years. I've been have like over two hundred poems. I'm still trying to get my stuff out there. Um, so basically, the the full length is because. Like someone, I, I just had it with getting rejection that people not mm -hmm. want to style. So I'm like, okay. Um, mm -hmm. so, I self, so I self did, and you can find it on Amazon. It's called, um, it's called Abre la Puerta. So it's a Spanish title, but you can, you can, look, you can find it under my name, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Emilio de Puerta. Um, but if not Abre la Puerta, if you know Spanish, it's like A B R E la, and then Puerta, which is my last name. So if you find my last name, you didn't, didn't, mm -hmm. didn't be there too. So, um, so yeah, that's what it's called. And you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes & Noble. You can find it on, I think, Baby the Races has it. I think, um, what else has it? A bunch of, a bunch of um, sites have it. Um, but, yeah, if you like that poem, if you like um, uh, my work, then there you go. You can find my, my, full, my self full length on, um, on, on any of those places. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks so much. I, I love the form. I always I always talk about that. I wish we had more form, formal poetry submitted to Rattle. Uh, and there's certain little enclaves of formal poetry. I don't know if you connect with any of those, but like at the Able Muse, that erratis, erat, erratosphere, I think they call it, the uh, message board at ablemuse.com is full of formal poets. Um, and there's just a lot of great stuff to be had in the formal poetry world, but it's a little niche, and I wish it would be more more popular. I know. So um, I've been I've been trying to like get a what is it, like trying to start a whole movement about like form poetry and and how and how to actually write it, mm-hmm. but slowly slowly getting off. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, but I won't keep you longer. So <laughs> well, thanks so much for calling again. It was a real pleasure. I'm glad well, to have uh, repeat callers. It's really nice to it. It sort of feels like we're all sitting around enjoying poetry together. So I love. Uh, you know, you, Mr. Wamble, Kim Tidro, um, all the people who, who uh, are regulars now already. It really feels great to have, have people who, who keep calling in and participating. So thanks so much, Emilio. Thank you. Um, okay, good night. night. Okay, so I am going to um, we're going to do one more, at least, uh, one more pre-recorded poem. And maybe save the other two for next week. But I see... Um, Patrick Murphy's here in the in the comments. If you go to if you're watching live, you can comment on the uh, ch- in a little chat box on YouTube, and um, I see that Patrick Murphy is there. So I want to make sure to read his poem. Uh, he sent one a couple weeks ago, and I told him it would be on today. And that he's from Dayton, Ohio. And um, let's see. Let me look at his. Patrick Murphy is a writer from Dayton, Ohio, published in the Blue Nib Literary Magazine and on Spillwords.com and Poetry Juice Box. And he's going to be reading Why I Hate Falling. Uh, And here he is, Patrick Murphy. All right, my name is Patrick Murphy. I'm a writer out in Dayton, Ohio. I am submitting to Rattle's open mic right now. Um, This poem just... I wanted to share this one, just get some opinions maybe, see what people think of it. It's kind of not really, I guess you could say it's a little personal, but what poem isn't personal? So I'm just going to get to writing it. That's all I really wanted to introduce myself as. All right, this one's called Why I Hate Falling. I left a note to the world yesterday. Thank you for falling. It collapsed right in front of my feet where I was ready to step over it like some wailing puddle. Everyone always wants it to happen where the world falls right in place, letting everything just go time and time like ringed, like a ringed up circular pattern of just right incantations. Where the witch is your life and your goals are the curse. It's merely nothing but feeble ideas that fall to, fall into the past where nobody is left to keep them up. Falling is detrimental, especially when it's for someone else. It's like riding a bike for the first time. You love it. It's fun. Fast. You swerve and turn around the roads, up and down hills. No second thinking, just pure action. Then learning to use the brake system and falling afterwards. It causes hesitation, worry, it, and opens a new Pandora's box. The one where you know you fell before, but life is still needed to be lived, and all you have to grab yourself above the line is your two bare hands and a memory. This is why I hate falling. This is why I keep my head and hands separate from all things with a height. So, if I ever do fall, at least getting back up won't hurt as bad. Well, thank you. That was... Patrick Murphy from Dayton, Ohio. Reading Why I Hate Falling. Thanks so much, Patrick. And uh, Patrick asked uh, if you have any comments. uh, Feel free to leave them in the chat box. Um, Thanks so much for sharing that, Patrick. That was Why I Hate Falling. Um, Excellent poem. I enjoyed it. Um, Let's see. We're going to try calling... Uh, we're just going to try calling Davian Tinsley here. Make sure I don't have the phone on yet. Okay. D- 
Davion, hi, yeah, yeah, I'm, get, I'm gonna pull you in in just a second. Uh, I see ya, I hear ya. Yeah, hey, just one second. Here you are again, so, uh, let me see, let me make sure your sound is good. Uh, so you're calling from, if I remember right, it was uh, St. Louis, so St. Louis, Missouri, is that right? Yes, sir. Awesome, well, thanks so much for calling in. It's, like I said before, it's great to have repeat callers, I really appreciate it. Um, so what do you have for us today? This is a poem that's, again, oh, I haven't been doing any new poetry lately because I've been working on a book that will be coming soon. But it's an old poem, but it's more of my style. I feel like last week I've done a style that was inspired by somebody. So it was still my words, but it was a different style. So this time I'm, I'm going to do mine. Awesome. Well, thank you. Let's hear it. This poem is called Thinking. Thinking of you. So this is what a break feels like. I have to say I never had my heart tested this much. I've always felt like my life was needing something. Now it's missing her little touch. The spark that brings light to the life of a heart darkened. Blowing smoke of the gas pass around like a coughing. Note to self. Sight of heaven is heavier than the image of self. Built a house inside my heart. I stay to myself. Because I only want to visit you. Let the soul inside us both meet each other. Blaze one or two. I've been talking about all this smoke and chill sh with you. But life has a cruel game to play. Let's push them together. Let's push them closer to a dream, then take it away. Soul searching. Back to square one. Still flirting. A heart. <clears throat> oh, I love this part. <clears throat> a hurt and hopeless romantic and a panic attack to knowing your worth and being worthless. You don't believe me? Why? You're the only person I mean something to. The only relationship where I feel comfortable. All facts. You are like a teen niche show, baby. You are all that. I know you got school to finish and sleep to replenish your energy. I got time to think, but everything goes down the drain like a sink that you sink in, scarring me mentally. It has been the worst couple of days since we did what we had to. We didn't want to, but for you to succeed, I'd be glad to. No distractions. A quarter for your thoughts, a half in your lungs, a third in your cup, take with a vibe hole. I was doing fractions. Took a chance with you. Like a beautiful picture to capture. Strong as a bone in a world filled with tiny fractures. With you by my side, I am enthusiastic to get a win. Now I'm laying here looking at the other side of my bed thinking, when I'm going to see you again. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. That was Davian Tinsley from uh, St. Louis, Ohio with that poem. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank and and thanks, for, thanks for calling it again. That was great. I uh, hope you do sometime soon. And have, I'll be on. Awesome. Have a good night. You too. Okay, so uh, let's see. We'll do one more, uh, one more open mic poet to close it out. Um, I had planned on Alicia Hammond, and um, John Luna had a long poem. It's about ten minutes long. We'll get to that someday. We don't have a lot of callers, but but I want to make sure that the uh, people who actually want to call in live on Skype get the priority. So if you want to call in on Skype, I think we're going to have a rule. Maybe we don't do people the same people back to back episodes, but uh, otherwise, as many people calling in as we can, we want to give those people the priority. So let me give a call to uh, Joshua Corwin, who called last week. Uh, just have to hang on a second while I ring him up. Joshua, hey, I hear you. Um, your video is not on yet, but but I'm sure it'll pop up in a second. Make sure you close the uh, YouTube window so you don't have the feedback and delay. Yeah, no. Okay, well, uh, yeah, click the camera, please do. Yeah, so we can see you. There you go. Hi. Hey. Yeah, you're inside. Last week you were in a car. Just one second. Let me pull you in to the actual stream here. Okay, you're here. So um, um, say hi to everybody. You're live on the Rattlecast. Hey, everyone. Much easier this way. I'm Joshua Corwin. 
and um, thanks so much, Tim, for having me on. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for calling again. It, it's really great to uh, to like I said, have people that, that call in regularly and uh, show how easy it is to do use Skype and, and join in this way. Uh, I really appreciate it. You're sort of early adopters, and uh, you know I think hopefully a lot of people will be doing this in the future too. Uh, so what do you have at first? Oh, you're uh, this is Joshua Corwin again, and you're a poet from uh, Los Angeles. So you're right down the down the hill from me. Yeah. I could I could roll yeah. down and land on you. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, you could, even if you want, I, I actually have my first featured performance, so it's real groovy to be doing this. I'm not going to be reading the poem. Uh, that's actually tomorrow anyways, but mm-hmm. so feel free to maybe later. But <laughs> anyways, I'm going to read this poem. Yeah, uh, please it's do. in uh, the uh, Spectrum 20, Who's Your Honey? Um, uh, so in print, local Pasadena thing. And the poem I'm going to read is called Salt. I might be able to be published next month or two. If I unloose my hard ass, closed minded dignity and write up some little goody goody two shoe gumdrop on a theme, honey, baby, honey, like the bear that meets my eyes in the kitchen syrup as slow as an igloo, isolation, like my cave. I seek no honey. I want salt, sweet salt. Slimy like the back of my hand, the hand that bites you, that talks to you in posture, outstretched like an Aretha Franklin novel, if she ever wrote one. Honey, honey, baby, should I stoop so low? Like stints gone wild, stilts going under the door cracks. Honey, I was paranoid of myself. Honey, I can't be honest with you. Honest, I just lied. Honey, I just picked my scalp until it bled and showed you the bloodstained sweat that is the vicious honey, the corporeal Reflection of your tears, salty like the sea, salty like the drew drops I put into the lentil pasta a la Josh Especial. With what? With not honey, but salt. Welcome to my world, salt. Like the Dead Sea, salt. Call me Yisrael, call me Yeshua. Salt, don't build me up, honey, but tear me down. Salt, don't protect me, honey, but reject me. Salt, I don't need to find you. You don't need to find me, honey, please. Can you just be, can you just be me? My salt, maybe also honey, perhaps like heads and tails, Honey and salt are flip sides of the dew drops of the rainbow. Well, thank you. That's Joshua Corwin uh, calling it again. Um, Carrie Radner, who called earlier, says this poem should be called Honey Slash Salt. So you already got some feedback Ooh. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thanks. so thanks again for calling in. And I uh, hope you keep calling in. It's a, it's a real pleasure to have these live yeah. open mics. I, I just love open mics. That was my favorite part of the poetry reading. Never yeah. knowing what's going to come up and who would show up. So oh. it's really fun. Hey, quick question. Can I, um, you know, the, uh, mention a quick thing that's going on with this? Uh, I don't know if it's okay with this same place that did this. Yeah, yeah, sure, up, sure, go ahead. Th- this show is supposed yeah. to be a celebration of poetry. So if it's related to poetry, yeah, please this, do this, share it with everybody, yeah. Yeah, this Spectrum um, is actually releasing a special Cento edition that they're taking submissions uh, for up to uh, October 13th, and I think you can find it um on spectrum publishing blogspot or something like mm-hmm. that yeah I forget the exact address well just google spectrum yeah cool. yeah okay cool cool yeah and, and those are all centos cool new forms mm-hmm. so that's something to look forward to that's awesome yeah well Check out for everybody who's watching awesome well thanks so much for sharing that and once again that was joshua corwin i uh, hope you have a great night and i hope you I'll see you next week you too take yep, care yep. 
Uh, so that was uh, Joshua Corwin again. Uh, thanks so much for calling. To everybody who called in tonight, uh, that's going to be the end of the show for tonight. Uh, but it was a great show once again. Uh, we were looking at, uh, just to remind you, we were looking at uh, Hansel and Gretel, Get the Word on the Street by Al Ordolani, which is the one of the Rattle Chapbook Prize winners this year. I didn't mention during the show, but this uh, painting was actually done by one of Al's students. So, and she does all of the, as far as I know, she does all or most of the covers of his books, and it's, she's a great painter. Um, so, so Al kind of has that going for him, too, in addition to the great storytelling that he does. If you subscribe to Rattle, um, if you subscribe to Rattle, uh, you get this issue automatically with the uh, fall issue. Every, every uh, issue that comes out, which is quarterly, uh, comes with a new chapbook. And uh, this fall, it was, it was Hansel and Gretel get the word on the street. Uh, we also talked about the, the warm-up poem was, uh, was from Tales, of the House of, Tales from the House of Vasquez by Raquel Vasquez Gilliland. Uh, she's going to be at the, Rattle, or at the Wrightwood Literary Festival this weekend. Uh, on Sunday at uh, 11 p.m., she has uh, the faculty reading. She's also teaching some classes there. Uh, so do if you're within the LA area. I know, uh, I know some people uh, who've been calling in and stuff are, are close enough. So do come out and say hi live and in person, not just on Skype. Um, as always, please do click the uh, like button on this video because that helps it pop up in people's uh, you know that that play next on YouTube. Um, and I should say too that these, if you you're not watching, uh, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, these are also available as audio only podcasts. I clean them up a little bit, and then they're fed out that way on iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn and all those places. SoundCloud is what hosts them, so check it out there. Um, and make sure you tell all your friends to subscribe to this uh, Rattlecast. It's a lot of fun to do. Uh, let's see. Next week we will have Ah Jamie Hecht. Another of my favorite poets. I'm kind of, kind of cherry picking my favorite poets here. Uh, Jamie Hecht is one of the 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 most, really most intelligent people I've ever met. He's sort of a genius, and uh, his his book came out. Uh, Mi- Limousine Midnight Blue came out about ten years ago. He has a new book called Dodo Feathers, which just came out, and so we're going to feature him on the Rattlecast. He's been in Rattle maybe like three or four times. Um, he's a formalist. He's an actor. He's a psychotherapist. So. Um, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about with Jamie Hecht, and uh, he, he performs his poems really well. Uh, he writes a lot of formal poetry, a lot of blank verse, and it's going to be a great episode, so be sure to tune in next week, same time, same location. Coming up, we have a lot of great poets. We have uh, Bob Hickok's going to join us, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye is going to be on. Um, I'm sort of lining up poets as we go. Uh, Courtney King Campa will be on soon, too. I'm trying to think Ellen Bass. Um, uh, Aaron Puchigian, I got I got to set up a date for him, but uh, we have a lot of poets coming up. It's going to be a great fun. It's always fun to do the open mic, so please do that and click the subscribe button and all of that stuff. And join us next week for Jamie Hecht, and I will see you then, if not sooner. <laughs>